Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Will. That's right. That's our company, Ball Publishing. It's a division, a little tiny division of Ball Horticultural Company, which is the, the big giant, I guess you were referring to, that it was to find it unusual that a, a company like Ball has a public publishing division. And it is unusual. I can't think of any other uh, uh, company, corporation within any industry that has its own publishing company. It's almost like if Ford owned you know, road and track magazine or something yeah. like that. Um, it, it does make it unusual. And, and I can go into the story about why it happened at some point, but, but horticultural publishing is a very small mm -hmm. specialized field. There's not many of us out there. There's not many uh, editors in what we do. We, mm -hmm. we, only, we have a few competitors out there with a, a couple of editors each. So maybe there's a, you know, a dozen of us running around yeah. the country yeah, wreaking okay. havoc on poor growers like you guys <laughs> asking questions and telling your stories. Yeah, we are, our Grower Talks currently has a circulation of somewhere around 20, 18 to 20,000 uh, print subscribers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been higher than, than that, but there aren't that many growers out there. You know, we, we, we select who we go to uh, because it costs a lot of money to mail a, a print magazine out there. But if you're in the industry uh, in, in the U.S. or Canada, you can get it. But now with digital technologies like Zoom, like emails, uh, we, we reach around the world. No, I got into it very accidentally. Uh, in college, I bought my then girlfriend three six packs of cocktail begonias um, because they were at Kmart and they were uh, three for two dollars. Two and things we haven't heard: Kmart <laughs> and cocktail begonias. That's, that's been a while. You know that story, though. <laughs> that's how I got in the industry. Uh, I told the Minari people that story before. Uh, the breeders of cocktail begonias. They actually sent us a couple of cases of cocktail begonias in celebration. But uh, my girlfriend at the time. Didn't know what she was going to major in. She fell in love with plants, instantly changed her major to horticulture. Uh, she's now my wife of 42 years. And in college, I was planning on journalism once I figured out what I was doing. Uh, but I needed a specialty in journalism. Um, and I picked horticulture. Uh, this was at the University of Florida. And because, because she had gotten into plants and was now majoring in horticulture, I got into plants. I said, Man, maybe I can write about them. And something else nobody had done at the University of Florida, I don't think, is major in journalism and minor in ornamental horticulture. Uh, so that's what I did. But uh, long story, just a little bit longer. I didn't actually intend to go into journalism. We opened a greenhouse business right out of college. So I was going to be a grower. Uh, and, and that was the plan. Although we found out it's a very tough way to make a living, especially in Florida. And so after 10 years, we closed our, our greenhouse. It was called Indian River Ornamentals. If you've got Florida listeners, they may remember it to the east coast of Florida. And I said, well, let me see if I can write about this horticulture thing I've been doing for 10 years. And uh, that's what led me to Grower Talks a magazine 30 years ago. Uh, and here I am still. Yeah. <laughs> It is. It is. I actually just wrote my column about that for the December issue about how my career going from a sports journalist background into horticulture. It's a little bit of a... I'm surprised you're not wearing a Cubs jersey right now. Or well, a Bears jersey or no, I'm not wearing a Bears one. I'm mad at them right now. But um, yeah, just got, uh, the mix of like t taking advantage of opportunities and luck. I actually always knew I was going to be a writer from a very early age elementary school winning awards for short stories and poetry and I thought I was going to write the great American novel but then as I got a little bit older I was you know grew up in a very heavy sports household and I, I writing sports I'm like I can combine those two kind of like you were talking about with journalism and horticulture yeah, yeah, yeah. so I actually have a journalism degree 
with an emphasis in sports, but um, you really have to, uh, you know, with, with a newspaper background mostly. And I did some radio actually, but in uh, broadcast, but uh, you have to move around, pay your dues. Uh, sweaty locker rooms. Sweaty locker rooms, which I don't mind that as much, but more more like sweaty editors <laughs> that you have to give coffee to before you are allowed to write your own column. And, and Yeah, because there's like, what, a dozen of us, and there's like a million sports journalists well, out there all yeah. competing. Well, for and this was during the, in, in the 90s, which I'm dating myself, but, um, you know, it was much harder for a woman to really break through back then. And uh, so I did some corporate writing, and then I ended up coming to Ball, uh, in their marketing department, and Did you uh, ball? I just looked. I was not really. I was at a different company. I didn't like what I was doing there, and I'm like, well, I like plants. I could write about plants. I could, you know, write, uh, you know, catalog copy and ad copy and and name a, a few petunias. But uh, after a while, I was like, this is not what I want to do with my life. And uh, the opportunity presented itself at Ball Publishing, and I took advantage of it. And I've been with. Ball for 20 years. I've been in the industry for 20 years, but with Ball Publishing for 14. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of Well, I mean, relationships, it's, it's interesting with being a trade journalist because relationships are a huge part of being a trade journalist because if you're a bit, you work for a B2B publication or, or a, you know, a digital product, you are a, an industry advocate, right? Uh, you were allowed to be, I guess, a little bit biased? Maybe a little yeah, bit. we should. If, if we didn't love horticulture mm -hmm. and support our growers, we'd be out of business quickly. So, so you want to build relationships. We want to see... Uh, you know, everyone we interview be successful. Right. Uh, as I mentioned I think yesterday, I hate telling bad stories oh. about this industry. We have to. We are journalists, after all. Um, but uh, we want to tell the, the positive stories, and everything we put in the magazine is to help businesses be successful, whether it's controlling pests or selling more product or finding labor solutions or, or new varieties, whatever it is. It's all about building up the industry. And this industry is unique too, in that it is so family oriented. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's another one uh, like it on the planet. And that makes it special too. I think it's what all of us, you and me, and we all, oh, all yeah, included, sure. uh, love about the industry. It's, it's, it's family oriented. So it's, it's very easy for us to pick up the phone or shoot a quick email right. to the owner of the company and have them, you know, not only invite us out, but then, you know, we go out to dinner afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you know, try that in any other industry where you're going through layers and layers of, of uh, you know, corporation and PR people and things like that. That has to be frustrating. Well, even with the mass media, you know, if you're a political reporter, or even a sports reporter, a lot of the relationships you have with your sources are transactional. You know what I mean? It's more like, well... You wash my bag, I'll wash yours. Or scratch. scratch. Is that what you do? Scratch your bag. I think... Yeah. yeah well, maybe wash. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Depends how if you how bad you want the story, apparently. <laughs> but um, but here it's it's much more relationship driven, much more trust based. You know, I was visiting a grower in in Miami, and and I was with him, with him and, and and one of his um, coworkers, and we were talking about the industry, and she said, "Wow, you know a lot about what's going on. You know, all the little tidbits you hear, and some of the intel, like Chris likes to say, but." Uh, I said, yeah, but I only write about 20% of it because we do hear a lot of things, you know, that, that are, that happen. And, you know, we just kind of leave that in the back of our minds and use that to, uh, to figure out what we're, the stories we are going to tell and, and to kind of get the, uh, you know, have our ear to the ground and what's going on. You know, well, but our last doing. column ever is going to be a good one. Oh yeah. All the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a whole magazine. I have a, I have a running thing where I tell people that, that if there's alcohol on the table, it's right. all off the record. Because, you know, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, you're breaking bread with people and having a beer, a glass of wine or something, and people are loose and free and having fun. You don't want them to look at you and go, oh, quite, don't say anything. There's right. a journalist at the end of the table. That's right. People start buying me drinks about 10 a.m., <laughs> yeah. oddly enough. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you uh, can't I, drink all day if you don't start in the morning. I mean, you know. That's yeah. see, see. You can tell we're journalists. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't kidding. <laughs> There's a tradition going forward here. <laughs> Well, 
in small little ways here and there, but not much, not like it looked 20 years ago when all the consolidation was happening back around the dot-com days when you had these, uh, you know, uh, venture capitalists coming in, looking at our little batch of farmers all scattered around the country and yet selling to Walmart and Home Depot and Lowe's, the big boys. And they said, oh boy, we are ripe for consolidation. And they bought up operations around the country uh, and pretty much ran them into the ground almost immediately by wasting money and, you know, and flying around in private jets. Mm -hmm. And that didn't last very long. There's still a few, uh, a few corporate uh, uh, types uh, in operations, but those operations are still run by growers who are parts of families and, you know, our own company, Ball Horticultural Company, is fourth generation. Um, and so it, 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 there doesn't seem to be any sign right now that there's any reason to not think our our industry will continue being uh, family uh, family oriented. I don't know why that is, but that seems to be the. I think that's to, true on the think. wholesale side for sure. I think garden centers, you know, I think there there's a little bit more of a flux there. Um, they don't really have as much family succession as we've noticed with the wholesalers. That's the, that's the biggest challenge, though, yeah. is if you are a first or second or third generation business, passing it along to mm -hmm. the next generation. Uh, is as challenging as ever or more challenging because it's harder to make a living. Uh, people joke that uh, back in the day, say 30, 40 years ago, you spent a dollar growing a plant and selling it for $8. That, that line came out of the foliage industry, I guess, where I heard it back in Miami mm -hmm. uh, on a trip we were on. Now it costs you seven ninety five dollars to grow that plant that you sell for $8. Still. You know, uh, and uh, so it's tougher to convince kids to come into the business. They've seen just how hard it is. It's not an easy way to make a mm -hmm. living anymore. But I'm always heartened to see younger people who accept the challenge, who embrace new technologies and and uh, you know digital technologies and and uh, the things like that, and still see um, this is a great way to make a living. And those people are out there. Mm -hmm. I feel like it, it, it happened to a point mm -hmm. and there will be other op opportunities. Um, some businesses have just had a tough time. One in Pennsylvania New Jersey. Uh, and in New Jersey. And there's going to be some, some open space available for someone else mm -hmm. to buy at a good price. And so that will be not so much consolidation, but a bit, a bit of expansion, the big getting a little bit bigger. But we've also learned that there's only a certain amount of uh, economy of scale that you can achieve and going beyond that doesn't make things better. I think it makes things worse because then you're spreading yourself too thin and you have too many locations and too, too many different uh, uh, climates you're dealing with, mm. too many different uh, head growers who maybe aren't operating the same way. When you're dealing with a, a living, breathing um, product that's also dependent upon, you know, sales are dependent upon the weather, you know, uh, it, it makes getting too big very difficult. And so I think growers have kind of right-sized, whether it's a Metrolina that's one location covering the south, the east, and the east with a few satellite operations and a lot of contract growers, or it's someone like Altman in California that has done a really good job spreading out across the country more, but it's still a family-owned business, right. you know. Um, I don't, but I don't see any major changes happening. Now, I could be wrong, but we seem to hit an equilibrium with minor changes happening. At least on the here ornamental here. side, yeah. Yeah, I, we don't know as much about the tree and shrub side, but I suspect it, it uh, functions much the same.
Yeah, I th and I think some of the, the larger operations, they have found that being geographically diverse helps them with weather situations. Boy, if it's, if it's bad in Florida, yeah. but maybe it's pretty good in, uh, say, North Carolina, you can ship your product from one, you know, location to another. Uh, but then it still comes back down to the relationships um, that you talked about, uh, the relationships with the, 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 the growers who are producing the plant, relationships with the buyers. Uh, we've seen um, many operations uh, get into trouble by trying to run the business by spreadsheets or numbers or data, yeah. you know, um, you can't do that. You have to be in the stores. You have to be in the greenhouse. Um, maybe somebody will find some other way to do it, you know, just by looking at a computer screen. Uh, but I haven't seen that happen yet. Well, and you can finesse your, your inventory, right? If you have a satellites in the South versus, you know, the Pacific Northwest, you can grow two different types of, you know, it, uh, crops, you know, and then and your relationship with the breeders too. Yeah, the relationship with the breeders, relationships with your competitors, yeah. uh, cooperate, cooperate, what's the word they use? Co-op? No. no. When you're uh, cooperating with a competitor, but, uh, oh. the, the, but anyway, uh, you know, I know plenty of growers who, gosh, they're long on poinsettias or garden mums, but a couple of phone calls and one of their competitors in another region will take them off their hands because right. they need them. And that's the sort of thing that that, that that I think we all enjoy about this business. Um, I, uh, something else, I give a lot of advice to, to younger people coming in the industry, speaking to classes and things. And the number one piece of mm -hmm. advice I always give to them is don't burn any bridges uh, in, this, in this business, which is all too easy to do these days. But in our little industry, you never know who you're going to be working with or for or reporting to or or what have you. That's you know. right. And the memories are long. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the grudges are held <laughs> tightly. <laughs> I'm glad you never ticked me off when you were back there in the marketing department. I know. Right? I'm very glad about yeah. that. Jen does, Jen does all the work, so I don't have to. That's something I say. Uh, and as editor, Jen Zirko, she just was promoted from managing editor to editor. As managing editor, she did the day-to-day -day of producing the magazine, and I was responsible for the higher level, what's going to go in it, what's on the cover, those kinds of things, although she made a lot of those decisions. Now as editor, she's making more of those decisions, and I've promoted myself to editor-in-chief, which means I do less and less. You didn't promote less. yourself. Well, like, okay. Ball's HR kind of did that. <laughs> But, okay, so to answer the question, I'll let you answer, Jen, oh. from the day-to-day -day of running a magazine. People always want to know, how do you fill this thing up? I mean, it's, it's pretty fat. It's actually two magazines in one. Mm -hmm. You know, where do you get all that stuff? Well, I mean, I don't want to get totally into the weeds, but we do plan. I mean, each issue does have a theme. You know, we try to help sales in, in that instance. You know, we try to, you know, and also it's based on the timing, right? So the points that this issue is in May, plug-in propagation is in November, you know, so that it helps our readers, which is our primarily growers, to plan ahead, you know, what they're going to do for, you know, their next production season. Uh, we have editorial meetings where, um, you know, we editors get together with a couple people from outside of Ball Publishing, talk about what's going on in the industry, what are people saying, what are what are we hearing, and um, you know we base off base our plans off of kind of those discussions. Yes, yeah. but you did mention travel, and luckily we do have a, a pretty generous travel budget. It's mm -hmm. the, the whole Ball Corporation is very big on travel. In fact, if you go back to the oldest grower talks, I even I even have one here too. I didn't show you this before. An actual February 1938 issue of Grower Talks. And, and these are the same kind of things, germination complaints, pointers on perennials. These are the same things we could be writing about mm -hmm. today. Here's actually January 1941. Think about this. Uh, a month after we entered World War II, George Ball was out here uh, making Grower Talks magazine. But the reason I'm showing those is even back then, George... Ball, the founder of the magazine, he founded it in 1937, he and his four sons would travel the world, even back then, to, to, to visit growers in, in Europe, 
Uh, in Asia, and they had suppliers there. They dealt with Japanese breeding companies and German breeding companies, which, of course, they were cut off from in World War II. Um, so they've always had a history of traveling to see the world, and that's continued here 88 years later, yeah, whatever yeah. it is now. And so we have good travel budgets to get around the U.S., Canada, anywhere in the world. Jen just came back to my office this morning and said, hey, I think I'm going to Colombia <laughs> uh, next uh, February. Yeah. So, and I'll be in uh, Germany in January mm -hmm. for, uh, for for IPM, which I cover every year. Mm -hmm. That's how we get out there and find out, get into greenhouses, find out what's going on, what's important, stay in touch with our, our readers. Yeah, we you really appreciated it much more during COVID when you couldn't go anywhere and you were trying oh. to do a magazine uh, that relies so much on being on the ground and talking to people and and, and being at these events. It was it was. Not easy. We did it. But Thanks it was, to Zoom. Ooh, I'm telling you. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, it's, it's and, and of course, trade shows to find out new products, yeah, yeah, meeting course. the growers, mm -hmm. getting the gossip, what's happening, what's important to you. I thought it was the intel. Uh, uh, intel. Yes, industry <laughs> intel, not gossip. <laughs> you think Ooh. uh and, and 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 jen and i love going back through the old magazines mm -hmm. and, and reading how they wrote and what they wrote about there's some things you've never print today oh <laughs> no but some things like world war ii too i mentioned um you know at the time it was men working in the greenhouse yes. uh in the 30s uh, and, and uh, you know, wearing fedoras and jackets and ties and smoking pipes. Mm -hmm. Then they all went off to war. Well, to, we had to have women working in the greenhouse. What did they write about that back then? What did George say? He said that women were actually good people to hire. They actually do good work. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> That's yes, right. Yes, Rosie the Riveter could be Rosie the Waterer. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, Transplanter. Uh, yeah, and at the same time... Um, I can go back into any magazine from the 40s or 50s or 60s, pick it up, turn to something about, say, the old short course, the Ohio short course, which at the time was a one-day thing, and read that what somebody said about, we need to do better marketing. We're not good at marketing our products. Mm -hmm. Well, today, we're still not good at marketing <laughs> yeah. our products. It's so easy to go back and find things that they lamented back then, whether it's, we need to save labor, we need to cut costs, we need to do better at energy savings, and we still say those things. Yeah, there's there's topics that have been the same throughout the decades, right? And pests have not gone away. Right. If there's right. one thing, number one thing we write about, it's it's pests. Now, we're using biological controls mm -hmm. a lot more. Uh, in lighting, we're using LEDs. Yeah. AI. Uh, you know. Artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is fun. You know, watching. Uh, and that's another thing that's fun to, to look at in the, the pages of the magazines as you go through the decades. Uh, when I got here uh, in the 90s, a hot topic was mechanization automatic transplanters had just come out and the plug business was still, I won't say in its infancy, but the plug business was still new. And you now had plug specialists, uh, plug producers and vegetative products came in with the whole proven winners mm -hmm. deal. Uh, and then the mass market came in, you know, it wasn't just uh, Kmart and Sears. Now you had the big three in there mm -hmm. selling plants and dominating. So you can almost look decade by decade at these, these, these big trends, branding, Became a big yeah. thing for a while. There, there were twenty or thirty brands uh, out there. Anybody with a with a custom uh, pot and label thought they had a brand. So it's been it's been fun to watch those trends over the years. So you feel like you write about the same stuff and on the surface. Well, you have to you write do. about poinsettias every year. For yes, instance. I How do. do, you do that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it is a good. Point. And they're red. Now yes, you and they're red. red. But there's always something, it, 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 you know, you it, the 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 surface level topic is the same, but there's an evolution there. Right. There's always new, like you said, new autom automation, uh, new genetics that you could talk about, new changes in uh, in the market. Like even when I was I mean, it was just a small snapshot in New Jersey, but there were a couple of growers that told me like, oh, my whites are becoming more popular. I'm switching concentrate on whites. Now that the breeders are coming out with better white poinsettias, I'm switching these up, even though I've grown this white for 
you know, 15 years or 20 years. And that's where Jen was just last week was yeah. in New Jersey looking at poinsettia, yeah. uh, poinsettia growers. Mm -hmm. And she'll bring what she learned there and heard there into our next editorial team meeting when we talk about where have you been, what have you heard, what have you seen, and it might roll into some, you know, editorial ideas right, for, right. for the spring. And that's the key is to always know the hook, right? So, I mean, we do, we, we give away an award every year, a young grower and young retailer. And, and uh, every time I interview a young grower, they're like, oh, I'm not interesting or there's nothing good to write about me. But it's, that's not true at all. You know, there's always one little little hook that you can concentrate on, and that's what the story is about. Well, and story is the key word. Story. Is we are storytellers. Mm -hmm. I, if anybody asks, what do you do? I'm the industry storyteller. Wherever you go, it's looking for a story, an interesting story, mm -hmm. and a fun way to tell it. Yeah. And as we like to think we're talented writers. I've, we, we are wordsmiths. So. We love words. Somebody around here discovers an unusual word. And then suddenly we send emails back and forth. Do you know this word? Have you ever, did you know it was defined like that? Yeah. I just learned what a ter what a uh, an interrobang is. Oh, yeah. Do you know what an interrobang is? It's a, it's a punctuation mark that I never heard of. How can I have been a writer for 40 years, college trained, and never knew what an interrobang is? I don't know what that is either. An interrobang, so. for all you listeners out there, is the combination of a, of a question mark and an exclamation point. I didn't know that thing. was like a... If you put them both after a sentence, it's it's a thing. It's like, I can't believe it. <laughs> or can you believe it? Can you believe it? <laughs> it's a question and an exclamation, an exclamation at the same time. Yeah. Is an interrobang. This yeah. kind of thing excites us. And and I expect to see you use one of those in a, a, a an email or a document <laughs> sometime here, William. They are, it's a, it is a thing. It mm -hmm. is not made up. It's not the modern kids didn't come up with that one. Oh, there you are. So the intero must be the question mark. Yeah. Ah. Well, we just learned something today, too. Then. That's right. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you got it. You, you got to you know, but, it's, but it's when you can tell the stories about if people ask, well, what do you do for a living? Oh, I travel around the world uh, looking at flowers and plants and, and greenhouses and garden centers and, mm -hmm. and telling the stories of the, of the people who do this. And they say, no, that's not a real job. <laughs> well, it is. We've been doing it for 30 years. Well, the biggest challenge we face, and you brought it up at the very beginning, we are owned legally, technically, by one of the big companies in the industry, Ball Horticultural Company. It's a little, we're a little tiny division. Uh, we're sitting right now right above human resources mm -hmm. at Ball. That's so they can keep an eye on us. Uh, we, we have to turn ourselves in three or four times mm -hmm. a day for the crap we try to pull out <laughs> here. But, but Ball, because George Ball himself, that's his portrait there with the pipe, mm -hmm. he founded this thing. It's kind of sacrosanct around here. It's one of the oldest products in the corporation. Yeah. Uh, his granddaughter, Anna Ball, is a solid supporter of what we do and knows that we need to be 100% independent. She never once in 30 years of working with and for Anna has she ever come and said, Chris, you can't write that or you should write this or that. Mm -hmm. um, Ball advertises in our magazine. They're a good advertiser, but they have to buy the ads just like their competitors mm -hmm. do, whether it's Proven Winners, Doom and Syngenta, all the good supporters of us. And all of them, you can bet every single one of them is watching us like a hawk oh, yes. to, to look for those biases. Like, hey, you like Proven Winners better or you wrote more about Ball than you did about Doom mm -hmm. and this or something like that. So we 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 ride this razor blade of neutrality yes. and ob objectivity. And I think it's just been proven out over time that 
that all of these companies will let us in, will let us tell their mm -hmm. stories, will let us go to their offshore production facilities or into their back room because they know we will tell a fair story. Well, you said proven. We've proved ourselves to be trustworthy industry advocates, right? Yeah. So, but, 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 it, but you also know every time you send that magazine to the printer, boy, one little wrong oh, word or no. term or a little quote from somebody. Yeah. You had one of those a couple of months ago. A little, oh, a little yes. quote that somebody didn't recognize yes. as being fraught full of, of pitfalls. Yes. Um, almost came back to haunt us. Almost. <laughs> almost. We, we, we covered, but it, yeah. but it doesn't take much. When you when you print, you know, a, a, a hundred thousand words a month, and you do have done it for eighty years to, uh, to to not have something come back and bite you. And there's been a few little few little things, yeah. But we've done a pretty good job. Uh, and, and part of my training of Jen as she came in early was being aware of those mm -hmm. things, the politics yeah. of of the industry, and and all of these competitors who are customers of each other. There's a lot of a, a lot of undercurrent. Strange bedfellows, of. right? Exactly. You're running the magazine. Labor, labor is a big thing. Uh, yeah, you pay fifteen, you pay fifteen, seventeen, eighteen bucks an hour. Up in by Can Canadian dollars, it's you know twenty five bucks an hour. You're probably <laughs> paying up there, right? For anybody, because you you know just because that's what they can get from Amazon. And uh, gosh, you know my first part time my first yeah part time job I made two dollars an hour. Um, so uh, so it's much uh, more cost effective to buy. Uh, you know, equipment automation right. to control your I labor was costs. Say, to go along with that, then there's automation there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, pricing, that's always something. And uh, the markets, right? Uh, yeah, you know, people always want to know. What's, go ahead, Willie. Actually, it's, it's, that's an interesting one because we we've preached for years that growers need to raise their prices mm -hmm. and retailers re need to raise their prices. We tend as an industry to undervalue our product because we've got a million of them in the greenhouse and they're not special to us. We grew up with them, but gosh, you, you know, give the average consumer a beautiful six inch potted plant and they, they love it. You know, they don't know what it's, you know, what it costs to produce, what that plastic cost or the liner cutting, whatever it is. Um, so we've undervalued it. Well, with the pandemic, and all of the added costs that came through that, whether it's labor, um, logistics, inputs, inputs, you know, plastic prices, mm -hmm. uh, your diesel fuel for your truck, growers and retailers were forced to raise prices, and they didn't get any pushback. Right. So prices, you know, have probably in some cases gone up fifty to one hundred percent on some products in our industry with no pushback. But but now I'm, I'm I'm hearing from certain people where you go in and you know you're shopping. It's like I can't buy anything in this garden center for under ten dollars, and these houseplants are all you know under over twenty dollars. What happened to being able to go in and you know get something for four ninety nine or six ninety nine? And so I'm wondering if we'll see growers coming up with ways to bring back a a lower cost offering going back to seed varieties or less interesting, smaller mm -hmm. foliage varieties, or maybe less fancy, something like that. Uh, so that we can still have that, what one friend of mine in the industry calls cheap and cheerful mm. um, product in the garden center. Cause you still want to be uh, open to anybody like me coming into the industry, buying those three, six packs of cocktail begonias for $2 Gosh, what a shame if I hadn't been able to buy those. If they'd been 10 bucks and, you know, my pizza budget for the week was five, <laughs> which it was. Oh, pizza, wow. I spent part of my pizza budget on those begonias. Uh -huh. So nice. so will we see more variety of price offerings to keep ourselves viable to everybody out there, whether you spend, you know, five dollars or, or on a plant or 50 bucks mm -hmm. on a plant? Oh, and the day-to-day -day challenges, pests, you know, insect and disease management. That's always something. Never goes, never goes that away. That never goes away. What's new? People always want to What's find new? new varieties. And part of what I really love to do, especially when I'm traveling, is looking for ideas. Mm. Inspiration. People want, I say, in, uh, information and inspiration. Uh, so that's what I like to bring into the magazine. Love to go to cool garden centers mm -hmm. and find really beautiful displays oh, yeah. that you can, you know, rip off of your own garden center or great container packaging ideas for, for, for plants. Uh, so that's what I, I particularly like looking for. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we, we really work hard to find the experts on all these topics. Right. We are not the experts on much of anything except maybe making magazines. Mm -hmm. I think we're pretty darn good at that, but we're, we're experts at finding the experts. So if I want to know, how do I figure out what did it really cost me to grow this plant? I should have a plant on my desk. Oh uh, yeah. I just had to throw it away. And yeah. <laughs> I'm due for a fresh one. I'll buy one at any price. Um, but I want to know, what did it really cost me to grow this four-inch annual or six-inch, you know, pothos? Um, we turned to Bill Swanekamp mm. at Cube Pack Greenhouses, a master of knowing down to the tenth of a cent and explaining how to other, uh, to other growers, how do you calculate this? Because that's something that, that growers don't tend to be good at. Most people get into this business because they love growing plants, not because they're accountants. Um, and um, I always say, hey, if you're not good at it, you better hire somebody who mm -hmm. is because you need to know what your costs are. So we spend a lot of time teaching newer growers, well, you know, those basics of knowing how to, uh, to, to calculate uh, your cost of production um, because we want to see you stay in business uh, for another 50 years. Hundred percent, big part of our role. That and you know, and, and getting out there and finding people who are who are successful mm. at whatever level, um, and then share and getting them to share their stories. And uh, it's one thing we're both thankful for is that so many in this industry are so open. Yes. You just about never encounter a grower or garden center who won't tell you the answer to any question you have. Um, I remember going to Metroline Greenhouses. I mentioned that before. Um, 25 years ago when I first got here and meeting Tom Van Winger in the first time. Um, and he had just installed uh, some amazing new custom built cranes, gantry style cranes for moving product in and out of his greenhouses. One of a kind thing, custom built. Uh, nobody else on the planet had it. And I was asking him qu questions and I was taking pictures and he was answering every question, even, you know, how much did you do spend on this? And I finally stopped and said, Tom, why are you telling me all this? Why are you so open about this? He said, well, first of all, Chris, I want everybody to be successful. Mm. Second of all, anybody who tries to do this is going to go broke <laughs> trying it. And if they do succeed at it, by the time they've got it up and running, I'll be on to the next thing. So he had no fear about, you know, sharing his secrets because he knew he'd have another batch of, uh, of, of, of secrets uh, down the road. And I love that about this industry. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're the industry communicators, right? And part of, you know, part of the relationship building that we've we've had is, you know, listening to the intel. We were the first ones that wrote about cannabis, poss you know, being possible for the ornamentals market. Really putting, um, you know, shining a spotlight on the labor issue, especially uh, migrant labor, you know, and, and immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've really been the ones that kind of hear these things and, and, tr and bring it to the forefront and be the first ones to kind of communicate that to the industry. Well, the still, well we're, we're a journalist and we love a good scoop. Oh, well, yes, that will never leave. So <laughs> That's right. And, and it was 20 years ago this past Sunday that I wrote the very first Acres Online newsletter. Uh, before then, I had one shot every month to get out to the, to the industry, whatever news was happening. And then anything that came across my desk until the next issue went out, it was stuck on my desk. Yeah, um, but I quickly realized as I was struggling to find a way to use this new email technology, newsletter technology, that all the stuff that comes across my desk between the, the print magazine issues was perfect for a newsletter. So I could keep the industry informed every week 
about what's going on. And with the development of laptops and better internet and things like that, I can do it from anywhere in the world. And I've sent my newsletter from New Zealand and Tasmania and South Africa and Europe numerous times and, you know, 20 or 30 different countries. So that gives us an immediacy of being able to, you know, communicate right away, anything big that's happening. But the other thing, though, you would think that, that the internet would really um, be damaging to a print publication or a publishing company because now anything you want to know is just a, you know, a, a Google search away, mm. right? You could type in anything you want, William, and up comes 48 million different uh, options for you. Part of our job is sorting through the 48 million to the six or eight that are really important to you. Um, people overuse the word curate, but in a way we're curators too. All this information comes through. We decide which of it is really important to you, which of it can wait, which of it is only the kernel of like, oh, that's not the story. I got to make a phone call. There's a right. better story hidden in here. Um, that's why you won't often see us typing in press releases. We use the press release to find the real story, mm -hmm. pick up the phone, call the people, get the, get, get the, the, the real scoop. And then put that out there. Well, that's why I think all of our, our products complement each other really well that way. You know, your newsletter is like the timely news that comes out, you know, every week. Whereas the magazine, you know, maybe some of the news is in there too. But that's where we do the deep dives, human interest stories, where the technical pieces are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and then we got the webinars, you know, for education, podcasts too, videos. Mm -hmm. So all of our, all of that complements everything as content curators. Yes, we are. So there's... Certainly, the, the digital world has really opened up new opportunities. When I got here, we had Grower Talks magazine, and we had another print magazine called Floriculture International, which we've since uh, spun off to uh, some friends in, in Europe. And we had the Ball Red Book, which which in 1932 looked like this. <laughs> oh, wait. And, and, and now, oh my God, look, can you hold it up, Jen? <laughs> there it like, is. looks like this. It actually takes two volumes. Well, yeah, that's so true. So went from that to that. Yeah. So there's so print is not dead. I mentioned that uh, to you before. <laughs> print is print is not dead. It's just gotten a lot heavier and uh, more expensive to ship around the world. Yes, yeah. Sports Illustrated was in the news last week for, uh, you know, having AI generated articles that supposedly had a byline on them, and people called them out on it. We uh, <laughs> well, here's we, the thing. Here's what I'll say. Okay. When Chat GPT, yeah. When, when Chat GPT came out, I downloaded it. I don't know if you've ever played with it or not, William. But I, but just out of curiosity, I typed in a question and I gave it some fun little tasks. And after playing with it for just a, f a few days on, on a few different different uh, topics and sharing them with my mm -hmm. fellow editors, funny. I recognized ChatGPT's personality. Now, I'm not saying you could find a way to fool me with it, but given the basic instructions that somebody might type into it, we can now spot something that's been written by AI, yeah. uh, at least in its current you know mm -hmm. infantile s s status. And so we immediately had to make decisions that, we will not print anything that we think was generated by ChatGPT, and we've told our contributors that. Correct. Um, now, down the road, can ChatGPT or, or, say, AI do a better job of searching for solutions for white flies on your poinsettia crop? Maybe, but I think one of our knowledgeable uh, editors or our PhD um, D. J. C. Chong mm -hmm. can do a much, much better job of getting right down to the crux of exactly what you need to to know. Um, big, you know, you hear about it from medicine, like it can sort through millions or billions of possible diagnoses in seconds and help a doctor come down to a, a solution. Well, that's that's awesome, but I don't know if you know will that apply to plant diseases? Very possibly. If if someone finds it's profitable enough to to bother writing the, the, you know, the code that will make that happen. Well, how do you know that the information is correct, too? You know, there's a possibility, you know, it's a, there's a huge risk of getting misinformation. Yeah, and then who do you blame? Yeah. Whereas if you call up one of the ball technical specialists mm -hmm. and they tell you, based on your description of this problem, you've got Pythium, here's what you should apply, 
at least if it turns out you didn't have Pythium, you got somebody you can yell at. <laughs> well, now you and can And if you talk to Will Healy, I guarantee Will Healy was not wrong. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, just used the wrong product. Well, we've always provided, I mean, you, you know, you held up an old, or one of the original ones. We've always took very great pride in kind of the folksy nature of Grower Talks, right? So when we see people... You know, they see us and they feel like they know us because of the way we write. You know, we're informal and and uh, we kind of use creative license to uh, to be uh, to be personable. That's in our a, that's important to to, yeah. to note, Jen, because you can get all kinds of information, mm -hmm. but sometimes you don't want just information. You want entertainment, yeah, or you want you know you want some inspiration, as I said. So we have great columnists who are in the industry, mm -hmm. run businesses who are also tremendous storytellers right. who just capture your imagination and make you go, wow, that, I enjoy reading that. I can't wait to see what he has to say next month, as opposed to just some list of facts, you know, spewed out by, by AI that might be accurate, but is, you know, totally dry and boring. Yeah. We've, we've, we've um, actually started delving into AI for the industry a little bit more. Um, there's a time and a place for it. I think, you know what it's really good for? It writes great limericks. Oh, that does write good. And yeah. haikus. Haikus and limericks, yeah, especially yeah. with a horticultural bent. Give it a try. Yeah. You can have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. <laughs>
Zero, nothing. You can't find him online unless it's, you know, something's a Yelp review or something like that. And he never will. He's, I don't need it. And, uh, you know, when everybody says you, you have to have a website, you got to show your hours online. No, you don't. Yeah, well, I think as humans, we like to buck the system. It's, not, yeah. it's in our nature. So that, that mm -hmm. checks out. Sure. They're exactly right. There's there's a few trends that are wide open right now that that have been wide open for the taking since I started. One of them is quality. Mm. Quality is a, is a, is an overused term. Every grower I know has quality plants, but when you get right down to it, there's quality and there's like mind blowing right. quality. Not only of your product, but of your customer service. And and I always say if if you don't have Anything else to hang your hat on? If you don't have, if you're not big enough to get super automated, super efficient, super low cost to ship product, you know, anywhere in the world, you know, overnight, um, quality is 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 a wide open field. And I think that's what we kind of do with Grower Talks and, and all of our products mm -hmm. is we focus on the quality. We're a tiny company, we're ten employees, um, but but we look a lot bigger and a lot better because we focus on the quality. Mm -hmm. Well, the quality is what will get the sale. I mean, you you put a dead plant or a wilty plant, on, you know, and with a with a good plant next to it, obviously, who's you know, you know which mm -hmm. one they're going to buy. Yeah, I know a grower. He's not in business anymore. He was in uh, Nebraska. He grew one crop, and that was uh, one crop per year, and it was geraniums. He hand grew every plant. It wasn't a lot of plants, five or six thousand, I think, something like that, in a small greenhouse. Um, but he grew them like he was growing one plant, not 5,000, the way he nurtured it. He, he pre-booked every single plant to uh, consumers at very high prices. And as the season went on, his prices went up, not down, because his plants were getting bigger mm -hmm. and more full. He was able to extract more genetic potential from those, those plants than even the breeders. Breeders would go through his greenhouse and not recognize their own products because of the, the quality uh, and the time that he put into growing them. Now, was he crazy? Absolutely. The same, same, I same never man. heard that story. That's by a Bob oh. Fry from the plantation. Oh, Ask yeah. anybody in the geranium business about Bob Fry Did he from sing the to plantation. Them too? It sounds like he really No, but if, but, if, but if the conditions were right to apply Florel at 2 a.m. on a Sunday night, that's when he was out there doing oh, it, one gosh. at a time with an eyedropper or something like that. <laughs> and, um, you yeah, know, that's... You know, he, he was one in a million because of how challenging that was. But you couldn't criticize his quality or the, the price he got mm. for his plants or how beautiful they were. And that's that's fun to see. I love seeking those folks out. I would be dead if I had to write everything. I mean, seriously, we'd have defibrillators like under Chris's desk. No, we have a we have a, a, a core group of contributors, you know, newsletter writers that also will write articles too. But we also have a um, a well of experts that we tap into, whether they're academics or growers, retailers, consultants. Um, you know, I mean, a grower can always. I mean, especially if you, yeah, if he yeah. reads, if he or she reads your newsletter, he's, you know, they can contact Chris and be like, you know, I'm really interested in growing or contact me um, or find us at events and say, you know, I'm really interested in writing. I, you know, I like doing it. I like, and this is what I would like to write about. We're always, always open. Yeah. Always. The, the only criteria is you've got to have something to say. Yes. Um, we've always got room for guest columns. Mm -hmm. um, you, 
you don't have to be grammatically perfect because I've got high priced proofreaders who, you know, know the, you know, how to check spelling and punctuation and where they put an entera bang in or oh a, is it a colon or a semicolon? That doesn't <laughs> matter. It's the storytelling. Yes. It comes back to that. And our magazine, for as long as I've been involved in it, I have tried to fill it with growers, actual business owners. Mm. I think Jerry Raker was the, f might have been the first one who I, I kind of hired on a regular basis, um, formerly with uh, his family business, C. Raker and Sons. Uh, he wasn't, you know, great at spelling or anything like that. Uh, he'd much rather be out in the north woods of Canada hunting, which is probably what he's doing right now. Mm -hmm. But talk about knowledge of the industry and telling amazing stories. And just hearing him talk, I said, I knew he had to be in the magazine. And since I was able to get him in, we've had Bill Swanacamp, uh, Gary Mangum from Bell Nursery, Abe, Abe Van Weerner from Metro Line of Greenhouses. Mm -hmm. Now we have, we have a... Uh, Stan Vanderwall, you know, from Rainbow. Rainbow and yeah, so we, we love finding mm -hmm. people who either own businesses or manage businesses or are growing crops who say, you know what, I'd like to say something. Bring it on. Mm -hmm. Babies at GrowerTalks.com or Jay Zerko at BallPublishing.com. Mm Yeah, but we're too close. I mean, people who've been you know doing it for generations are too close to it. They don't find their their operation uh, all that interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but to us, you know, that's what we're trained to do is is go in there and dig it out. And it's not as often as you think the whole story. Like Bob's greenhouse was started by you know Bob Senior in 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 1944. You could tell those stories, but those are almost kind of easy. What you mm -hmm. want to dig in and is is tell the untold story that that tragic time in the 70s when you know fuel prices went through the roof and they almost went out of business or that amazing uh, innovation that the third generation brought in that turned the whole business around so it's often more often than not it's digging deep to find those untold stories um, and also short little stories you know what did the, what did you do different this season mm -hmm. that that um, that was that worked that worked great that you might do again that's a question you know, we, we learn to oh, ask, yeah. yes. uh, as opposed to just the, you know, Bob grows petunias and he sells them to Walmart mm -hmm. and, you know, there you go. Yeah, the hook. Yeah, dig, dig deep. It's the, uh, the what, do I, what do we call that? The question? egg salad question. Yes. <laughs> yes, he did. Oh, so you read my, you read my stuff, <laughs> right? You the egg salad question. The egg salad, and in this... Uh, ah, look at that. <laughs> there you go. That's what it comes from, from a friend of ours, uh, a dear colleague who we've worked with forever, mm -hmm. um, who we were at a lunch um, one day and, and we're just ordering sandwiches or whatever. And, and the waitress came to him. Uh, what would you like, sir? And he said, the egg salad. Tell me about it. And I guffawed. I think I wrote that. I guffawed. Well, because it's, what, it's egg salad. It's egg. It's mayonnaise. It's, and he turned to me and said, well, no, it could be pickle. It could have celery in there. It could have paprika mixed in, you know. There's, and, I, and I realized, well, I guess that's true, you know. Uh, even the waitress thought it was a little bit of a crazy question. But it stuck with me ever since. But for the longest time, it was really just a, more of a joke. But as I've become older and wiser and, and learned my limitations and what I don't mm. know, I realized... I always have to be, uh, we, we always have to be uh, reminded to ask that egg salad question. Yeah. Tell me about that. That's really what it is. When, when you say, yeah, I just uh, uh, brought in a, a new variety of poinsettia that I'm trying this year and it's worked out really well and I think we're going to switch over to that, you know, 50% um, for next year. 
I could just leave that quote at that. But I should say, well, tell me more Why? about that. Why? Right. To find what is it about the that new variety? Is it, you know, uh, less expensive to grow? Is it more durable? Is it taller? More, you know, um, we take too many things for granted. I've been in mm -hmm. this industry for 40 years. You've been in it for 20 years. It's too easy to say, oh, we know it all. We know the answer to that question because we saw it, you know, 10 times last year at other greenhouses. But by asking that egg salad question, digging a little deeper and saying, why? Tell me more about that. That's when you really get to the, to the, the most interesting stuff. Well, and that's the biggest mistake I think a lot of journalists make. You know, not just in our industry, but other industries. Where you, you know, how many greenhouses have you been in? A bazillion? Yeah. I mean, you, you can't walk in knowing or thinking that you know everything, right? You have to go in there with your mind open. And, and I'm, uh, you know, naturally nosy anyway. So even if somebody tells me I'm switching my, you know, this point set to this one, automatically my first thought is why? You know, why are you doing that? And you Jen know. is great at, at saying, now this may be a dumb question, <laughs> but, and it's never a dumb question. I've heard her say that a thousand times, and it's never a dumb question. I have to learn to do that, or I have to remind myself to do that. So that's something that applies to you, software sales guys, mm -hmm. plant sales guys, everybody. Ask the egg salad question. Mm -hmm. And people love telling, they love answering questions in yeah. this industry. Uh, I've never had anybody clam up and say, yeah, I can't tell you that. Not once in a while, but then they once always, you know, they say, I'll have to kill you. you know, they always throw that in there. <laughs> or they say, well, this is, here's the off the record answer, but this is what I want you to write. <laughs> we, that can, we, do get, we do get a lot yeah. of that as well. As I say, our final columns are going to be amazing. Oh my read. gosh, yes. <laughs> Well, we like to say we're big fish in a small pond, I suppose. We are, and, and you know, it gives us a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to do some really cool things. But I don't think we we let that go to our heads. No. Um, we're, we're pretty humble about it. I like to think we are. I mean, I got to interview the King of the Netherlands once with a group of six American journalists. I was... I was one of them because I have a relationship with the Dutch embassy. How does that come about? Not because of who I am, but because of Grower Talks magazine, who I represent. Um, so I, I, while I'm invited to speak, and Jen's now getting invited to speak at a lot of places on, on trends, and or, or I do a lot on automation and technology, everything I talk about comes from someplace else. Mm -hmm. I saw this at this greenhouse. I saw that at that greenhouse. Um, if you if you ask me, well, why did the guy buy that particular machine? Hopefully, I've asked the egg salad question, yeah. and I know specifically why he bought it. And I guess you know. So does that make me a bit of an expert on on that tool? Uh, I suppose, and maybe I'm maybe, maybe I should recognize that more. Certainly, uh, I've been so through so many trade show booths, been shown a new piece of technology, and walked through it, and been given the the, the specs and the details and what makes it cool. And because I'm interested in it, I remember it all. And then some other customer walks up and is looking at the machine and, and I hear them say something and I can answer, I answer that question for them. Oh, they do this and it works that way. And the next thing you know, the guy who's talked to me said, do you want a job? You know, you could sell these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we all have our, we all have our strengths, right? You, you know, you have the equipment and, and structures side, you know, I, I like to write about policy and, and, uh, government relations, you know, we all have our strengths, but yeah, we, you know, I say big fish in a small pond, but we're not the ones running the pond. We're just swimming, right? <laughs> we're not the, we're not, we're, uh, we're not the experts. We're just kind of uh, the ones that, uh, you know, take the information and, and. Uh, I guess, but then he's talking to us. You notice how often, if you're watching the morning news shows, 
the guests they have on are from the New York Times or the Washington Post right. no, it's or true. from you know some other some online thing because journalists get so much perspective. Yes, that's um, true. And I think that's an advantage we do have yeah. is because I've been to 30 countries and you know thousands of greenhouses and garden centers. I have a perspective that nobody else has or that an ec- or a deep dive expert on one topic doesn't have. They have that, you know, deep dive on, you know, how this machine works, but they haven't seen the other guy's machine running there. So I, I suppose in many ways we are the experts, mm-hmm. but um, um, well, we pro- don't let it go to our head. That's no, all I'll say. No, I mean, in the, in the nature of our products, uh, you know, give us uh, visibility, but maybe, you know, we don't consider ourselves to be the you know, the experts. Right. And also because together we have 50 years combined experience mm, with true. Grower Talks magazine yeah. covering the industry. Um, we're dedicated to this industry. Yes. I will, you know, I've been in it since I was in college, you could say when I was 20 years old um, and I will die in this industry, you know, alongside my wife who is still in the industry as a professional horticulturist. And uh, and you can't help but, uh, I guess, pick up a few things in that time. I would think so. I don't know where you're going next. Well, unless HR, ball HR kicks us out. <laughs> <I guess laughs> or Sports Illustrated yeah. calls. Oh, my gosh. No, they have AI right in their articles now. Mm. More like Rolling Stone. I let, her, I let her put sports analogies in. You can you can find Only a sprinkle, sprinkle throughout. She'll have a slam dunk or a home run. Or, mm, uh, maybe is, a little bit. Is that you know, kind of trite? That's trite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm not a sports reporter. <laughs> uh, you, what you will see from me is is quotes from P.G. Woodhouse um, or or, um, or Garrison Keillor now. Mm-hmm. Again, a couple of my favorite authors. I like that too, though. Yeah. Or people, people would say like, oh, she acts like she knows it all. I'm not going to talk to her. We've seen people do that too. Yeah. They come in, young journalists come in, they go to one event, and then you read what they produce oh. from it because we're curious, well, what was their take mm-hmm. on it? And suddenly they're advising the industry about what they ought to be doing. You know, and, and I think I've been here 40 years and I used to have a greenhouse and I still am nervous about advising yeah. the industry about what they're doing. You know more about what you ought to be doing. Mm-hmm. Here's a couple of ideas. Here's what other experts are doing, but I'm not going to tell you what you ought to do. So, yeah. so we've, we've seen that, that happen. But, um, but for me, it has been an advantage because I did come to this from my own greenhouse. Mm-hmm. And so having built and run and then closed a small, but, but viable greenhouse operation in Florida gave me a, a, a unique perspective that nobody else, not even Jen has. Right. Unless you I can get you to buy, build a greenhouse at some point. Um, You'll have to help me run it. <laughs> right into the ground. And don't, no, yeah. I think I could do it today. I know a lot more and I know a lot more. I will, cons- I'll show up at like 10 o'clock. Yeah, you got to get out there. Right? I'd hire a good consultant. <laughs> though, man. But but uh, when I, the first time I walked into a greenhouse as managing editor of Grower Talks 30 years ago, and I looked around and asked some questions immediately the person I was interviewing recognized that I knew what I was talking about and they'd never experienced that before with a journalist and they still haven't because there are, you know, nobody else has owned their own greenhouse. Now, Jen has been in hundreds of greenhouses all around the the country and and, and some more around the world. So she's getting that perspective uh, of understanding how growers around the world operate Mm -hmm. and, and appreciating that. Yeah. You know, the last thing I always ask, uh, well, I ask two things of growers, usually the last two questions. One of them is, what keeps you up at night? Mm. That's a good question yes. to kind of get right down into the, uh, you know, the crux of, you know, what is what the big headaches are uh, right now. Um, but it's amazing how many growers tell me they sleep pretty good. Yeah, that's true. You know, someone say, well, I got six kids. Yeah. I <laughs> sleep. <laughs> that's what keeps you up at night. Yeah. But the second question I ask is, are you having fun? Hmm. because as you can tell 
we have fun at what we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we could be as nearly as good at it if we weren't having fun. And the best business people I know enjoy what they're doing. No matter how stressful it is, how challenging, they find fun, real fun in combating those challenges and dealing with them, whatever. Because that's how you be. get through it. Yeah, and life is too short not to, yes. uh, not to, to you know, to, to have fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always, I like to say too, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And um, so I, I think our industry is full of fun and satisfaction. We are producing a product that is good for the planet. You can't find a single negative thing to say about right. it. Yes, you could pick on our plastic pots or our use of water or, you know, some chemicals and things mm -hmm. like that. Well, every, every industry has that. But, uh, but our, in, our products give back more than they take. They improve the planet as they grow. Um, the only thing that comes close is beer and pizza, I think, when it comes to the, the good that they do for the chocolate. Mm, chocolate, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, but you can buy that with some nice flowers. Oh, there you I can use some chocolate and some flowers right now. Uh, and, yeah. well, wine. Uh, wine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, so, that's, so. so that's my word. You gotta have, if you're not having fun, well, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. Jen? Um, I guess I, I concur. I don't know if there's any other words of wisdom that I would, I would impart, but that's, that's pretty much it. But if you want to find some words of wisdom, grab that thing right over there. This is what I think oh. one of our, here's one of our outlets. Oh uh, William, I told you as we, we are word people around here <laughs> and just for fun. And I would suggest anybody, you guys can do it at your office. Any, you want to have some fun with your staff Buy this game. I, I, I bought it last uh, Christmas for the staff. It's called ransom notes for those listening. Yeah. Yes, the, the ridiculous word magnet game, and you basically um, hand out a bunch of random yeah. magnetic uh, words to the people gathered around the table. It's fun to play in teams, and then you get uh, you pull out cards that have questions on them. Like this is a simple one: make a billboard for orange soda, and you've got words like what words do you have there? I got organic uh, spray. Immense. Leave. Yeah. Drink. Hey, that works. Oh, anger. Would you be angry about your no, words? No, battle. I don't know. So you have There's to use the words stuff. you get to come up. And I tell you what, the staff just loves. Alcohol. Lo <laughs> <laughs> mixes great with alcohol. Uh, so, so that's a, 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 a creative outlet because we are creatives. Mm -hmm. We love to practice our, our wordsmithing skills and you know stretch our minds. And I think it's a great exercise for any group yeah. That wants to just, you know, have fun, uh, get creative, get the juices flowing, a little bit of team building. Yeah. So that's something we love to do as wordsmiths mm -hmm. around ball publishing. Little uh, <laughs> yes. Oh. And, and leave it for you to find. A nice word salad. Or, yeah. <laughs> And so you've learned you've learned a little bit about uh, about the ball and how we work. Word magazine is uh, Inside Grower magazine. This one is uh, is for controlled environment agriculture. It focuses exclusively on you know, greenhouse vegetables uh, or vertical farms, you know, that new technology, everything from, you know, mom and pop hydroponic growers up to the most sophisticated mm -hmm. new operations that may be out of business in 18 months. Um, but, but that's our, 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 our third publication. And um, we do 10 different newsletters, which you can find at growertalks.com slash newsletters mm -hmm. on pretty much every important topic out there, you can subscribe to all or or just the ones you want to select, and that way you get weekly or bi-monthly, bi-weekly. I don't remember it's bi-weekly. Every it's bi -monthly. other week, every other week, information on specific topics. Uh, our most popular current new one, which every greenhouse grower should subscribe to, is called Tech on Demand. Mm -hmm. Comes out every Friday, and it is real time, real world cultural information about things that are happening in greenhouses right, right now, now. Mm -hmm. problems that real growers are having and the solutions for them. So whatever you're growing, somebody else is growing it and having a problem with it. 
and um, uh, we've got the answers in there. Uh, and that's edited by uh, our colleague Bill Bill Calkins, and it comes out every Friday. So that's our, that's our newest of the ten newsletters that we have. So software we leave to you. What, <laughs> I, what I have noticed though, William. So be careful about. I'll, I, I will I will give you I will give you the uh, the the benefit of, of thirty years of doing this is that I've seen many times a greenhouse or nursery operation realize that there's nothing off the shelf that will work. My business is too unique. So I'm going to write my own program, either, you know, in-house or hire a guy to do it. And it works so beautifully. They decide, you know what? Other growers are going to want to use this. We need to commercialize this. So I know that's the position that you guys are in right now. So I know that it, it's happened before. Um, they're probably, I, and, and uh, I don't know what the pitfalls of doing it are, but I think part of it is every greenhouse or nursery thinks they're unique and, your solution isn't the solution for their operation. So that's the, the, the exalid question, I guess, to ask, right? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Bill Swanacamp from CubePack Greenhouses. Now retired, but still willing to consult, I'm sure, on uh, topics. If you talk to me. <laughs> Then, then I would say the only other thing I can offer is we have some wonderful advertising opportunities <laughs> in Grower Talks, uh, very reasonably priced, um, or if you want to start even, even more humbly in any of our newsletters, there are some great opportunities, and I could put a sales associate in touch with you. Mm -hmm, so. There you go. You got your sales pitch. I've had my publisher's hat on. I've <laughs> been the publisher here. <laughs> Maybe both. We're small. You got to do it all. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 we know where our bread is buttered. It's a challenge. It's something you didn't, you didn't even, we didn't talk about is, you know, Grower Talks is free. We mail 20,000 copies of these things around the North America for free. All you have to do as a grower is once a year, fill out the little card. I know it's annoying, but please do now it. Now it's online and only. We don't have the little card. That's right. There's no little card. No. It, falling out in your lap. Yeah. You. So you go online and once a year, fill it out. And that tells me that you want it you're you're requesting the magazine and as direct request we can now send it to you um for free but it cost us a dollar 75 or something like that to mail every one of these well it's the advertising that foots the bill for a hundred percent of mm -hmm. that and so we have to keep our advertisers uh happy uh and we need more of them mm. so <laughs> It's the biggest challenge we face in that 100% of our revenues come, well, I shouldn't say 100%, but almost come from our advertisers or our, whether it's print advertisers, digital advertisers, like on my newsletter, sponsors of our webinars uh, or videos, those kinds of things. Um, but, and of course, you know, advertisers love if you write about their product. And, uh, you know, we want to make our advertisers happy, but we don't want to put out a product that is mm. nothing but a bunch of advertisements no commercials. And, and, and commercials, right? So finding that, that balance between, uh, you know, keeping our advertisers happy and providing great editorial content is really one of the challenges. It, it keeps us up at night, but it's one of the fun challenges as well. We can, yeah. make, we can make a reader happy and an advertiser happy at the same time. Uh, we've done our job. Then you can sleep. Then I can sleep, yeah. Let's do it again. We uh, we barely scratched the tip of the iceberg with things we could talk about. 
We could do a, we we could could do talk. A, we could do a gossip podcast next time. Oh, that would be fun. What you mean, Intel? Intel. Yeah. <laughs> no tell Intel. That's what we'll call it. Okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thanks for having us.